It is day six of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and there is no indication that Russia will end its invasion anytime soon. While all major Ukrainian cities are under the control of the government, intense fighting continues in various parts of the country. Russian forces have increased their use of artillery in the regions of Kharkiv and Chernihiv. On your screens right now is an administration building being blown up in Kharkiv. The images were tweeted by the Ukrainian foreign ministry. On your screens right now is a map tracking the Russian assault. As you can see, Moscow has launched its attack from three main sides, the north, the south and the east. The areas marked in red is where Russia has made gains in the last five days. New satellite images shows a Russian military convoy on the outskirts of Kiev that is more than 40 miles long. The U.S. expects Russian forces to try to encircle the capital in the coming days. The Russian army also reportedly reached the southern Ukrainian city of Kherson, near Moscow-controlled Crimea. The city's mayor said that the Russian army was setting up checkpoints on its outskirts. Now, Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv on Monday suffered major onslaught by Russian missile strikes. At least 11 people were killed on Monday. The city located in Ukraine's northeast has become the main battleground in the past few days. This has prompted President Zelensky to accuse Russia of war crimes since residential areas with no forces were targeted. Well, for more on this, joining us live from Moscow is our correspondent Stuart Smith. Stuart, good to see you. Most observers thought Russia would quickly overrun Ukraine, but that is seemingly not the case. What are Russians' view of this current situation? Yeah, well, the Russian view is different in that it only outlines the successes of the Russian military and only talks about uh, the war in a very vague sense. So, for example, the latest update from the Russian Ministry of Defense provided late last night here in Moscow talked about uh, small territorial gains in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, those separatist regions you may remember that Russia recently declared independent. On top of that, it talked about hitting so far 1,100 targets since the conflict began. And it also mentioned that uh, 110 Ukrainian soldiers had been captured. But that was about it. There was no more information on, for example, Russian equipment losses, Russian casualties or Russian deaths. There was no uh, news about any change in strategy or any uh, advances elsewhere in Ukraine. So limited information being provided and only favorable information. But as you said, there is a, a changing of the situation, especially near Kiev. Western intelligence agencies monitoring it say this is in response to the so far failed uh, way that Russia has tried to uh, tackle this invasion in a sort of speedy, quick, in and out type of operation. That hasn't worked. And so that column of, as you say, around 40 miles long, 65 kilometers north of Kiev, the front of that column is around 20 miles away from the city. And this is a different approach, one backed up with strong supply lines and uh, tanks, artillery and uh, armored vehicles all making their preparations for uh, the ultimate game which Ukrainian generals say is to encircle all major cities in Ukraine including Kiev. Ukrainian authorities are calling for a no-fly zone to be enforced by the United States which it says it will not do because that would mean for example NATO forces shooting down Russian planes over Ukraine. It's the kind of uh, escalation and involvement which NATO is not willing to do but the US and EU promising more funds and more equipment for Ukraine. One thing interestingly the Russian military says it has full air control over Ukraine right now. The UK Ministry of Defence says that's not true. Stuart, let's talk about the West's action uh, when it comes to sanctions. Do you think this resoluteness by countries such as the US and Germany has caught Putin by surprise? <laughs> 
I don't think it's anything like he expected in terms of uh, in terms of the response that Russia has seen before. Previous rounds of sanctions would definitely have uh, an impact on Russia eventually, but were quite weak in the eyes of the Kremlin in terms of actually their effect on Russia. The Kremlin always said. Uh, these won't affect us. They just brush them off as unimportant and uh, without impact. This time, the Kremlin has actually admitted there will be damage done to Russia by these sanctions, but it's still not saying uncontrollable damage or the end of the economy, nothing like that. But it is saying it's going to hurt and it will be responding in kind. I would suggest it was unexpected, partly because it is unprecedented. These are the toughest sanctions ever imposed on Russia. And on top of the sanctions themselves, you've had such a reaction from the international community outside of the financial spheres. Like uh, today we heard the latest Disney, Sony and Warner Brothers will not release their films in Russia. There's so no Batman premiere in Moscow anytime soon. Uh, FIFA and the International Olympic Committee are looking at potentially stopping Russian athletes and teams participating in their sport. It's sanctions for sure, but it's also cultural boycotts. Away from the Kremlin, how are Russians reacting to sanctions imposed on their country by the West? Well, this is it. And, that, and that's exactly the framing I think the Kremlin would suggest is going on in that these are sanctions imposed by the West on ordinary Russians to harm the Russian economy. And because uh, effectively they, they say the West is racist, that this is against the Russian people because they're Russians. What is not being said, of course, is this is an adequate proportionate response to the invasion of a neighboring state. No, this is a humanitarian intervention by Russia in the eyes of the Kremlin. And people do certainly believe it and take on that point of view that this is an intervention justified in Ukraine to protect Russian speakers and civilians from being attacked by a, a genocidal government which is filled with neo-Nazis. That's the line that comes out and that's what you hear repeated amongst people in the street. And not everyone, to be clear, there are protests going on in Moscow, St. Petersburg, other cities around Russia uh, each evening, uh, slowly getting smaller and smaller in scale, I should say, though, due to many of them being arrested, fined and jailed. Uh, but there are people against it, of course, but I wouldn't say that's the majority of people necessarily. Uh, there will be people that see these sanctions being imposed on Russia and will interpret it simply as an attack on uh, Russia by the West. And they will blame not the Kremlin and not Putin's policies. They will be blaming America for their upcoming hardships. We have been listening to some cybersecurity experts who say that Russia didn't expect such resistance from Ukraine and that Russia's invasion strategy so far is like a textbook example of not what to do. What do you make of that statement about Moscow's strategy? Well, I have read different military analysts, and I wouldn't presume myself to try and analyse the military strategies, but that does seem to be the prevailing opinion, not just of independent military experts, but also, for example, the US and UK Ministry of Defence, that the strategy being employed didn't make good use of Russian air resources, that uh, there was an attempt to move fast and quickly, uh, take cities you know, within approximately three days, that there would be little resistance by the Ukrainian people, and it would be a quick operation. And in doing so, Russia neglected its supply lines, its logistics, and then there were all these videos and scenes of tanks becoming stuck on the highways towards major cities because this was not meant to be a prolonged operation. But I think there's an important caveat here. We are, what, five, six days into the invasion, and this thing could go on for a long time. Russia has the resources, the will, the financing and the equipment to keep this going a lot, lot longer. And also Russia can escalate. If it were really wanted, for example, it could siege Kiev, uh, which is already struggling with food supplies. And also Russia has other weapons available to it. It simply depends on how willing Russia is to go to harm civilians and to, for example, use weapons which are banned under international law, which is the latest accusation from Ukraine regarding Russia's use of vacuum bombs. Stuart, finally, no breakthrough in talks. Humanitarian crisis is worsening by the day. The number of casualties is rising. Where does Ukraine go from here? What happens next? Yeah, Poland's prime minister saying around 350,000 Ukrainians have crossed into the Polish, uh, crossed the Polish border since this war began. 
in terms of the diplomatic situation, I would interpret the uh, diplomacy as slightly more positive. I would suggest that Ukraine is still looking into the possibility of a second round of talks. Russia says it's committed to diplomacy. Things did not end after five hours of talks on the first day, seemingly without resolution. People are still talking and there seems to be some hope, if not limited. We don't have a date or time confirmed for a second round of negotiations, but Ukraine says the relevant parties will discuss amongst themselves to work out when and where that could happen if there is to be a second set of talks. But Russian President Vladimir Putin did outline his um, his concerns with uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, and they are severe for Ukraine. If it had to make these concession, concessions, it would be a big deal. Russia is still asking for the, uh, quote, uh, denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. It's not clear exactly what that means. But also uh, Ukrainian recognizing that Crimea is Russian and also that Ukraine must become a neutral country that withdraws its request to join the NATO military alliance. Still huge requests for Ukraine to stomach. Live from Moscow, thank you very much, Stuart Smith, for your insights today. We On is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.